Good morning. I want to welcome you all to Smithville Brethren Church. Good to be together as we celebrate God's goodness to us. A couple of things I want to mention to you. First, uh, coming up in August, we're going to have the opportunity to be here on a Sunday afternoon on the 18th to hear Jeffrey um, playing the piano and Phyllis is going to join on some of those pieces. Uh, you will want to be here for that, as you already know, so uh, just make a note of that. We want to extend the sympathy of our church to the Shearer family on the unexpected death of Jeff. Uh, some of you have been following uh, what went on, an accident at home uh, that led to his death. Um, so we'll want to be in prayer for that whole family and all those related to the Shears as well. Um, also today, you may note from the bulletin that Sandili M. Quinazi is here from South Africa, uh, spent uh, some time here in the States for conference and is joining us today. He'll bring the message. Sandili is in charge of the South African uh, global partnership in, in, uh, for the Brethren Church. And uh, actually, we only met face-to-face -face at conference this year for the first time. We've been speaking on Zoom in a group and speaking on Zoom uh, independently. But what, uh, what I've been um, impressed by is the, the longer I talk with him, the more impressed I am with him as a man of God and a leader. So I'm looking forward for you to hear him today in the message. But then during Sunday school, he'll be sharing uh, a, a wider vision of the ministry that he's a part of in South Africa during our Sunday school time. So he'll have a presentation for us uh, there as well. So you can look forward to these, uh, these moments together. So let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy that is totally obviously undeserved you have showered us with love and you have called us into your family and all we can do is with our lives say thank you over and over again and so with the songs we will sing with the word we will hear receive and obey we want to say thank you once again bless you we pray for the Shear family and all those connected to uh, help them in these moments that your spirit would come to them and uh, minister to them and that those around would come to them and minister to them to help them through this super difficult time, Lord. Strengthen them for the days ahead and help us to focus our minds and our hearts on you. In Jesus' name, amen.
tell you it happened again last week. My wife took a trip into Wapakoneta, spent time with a little, little guy. And when she came back, she could not wait to show me pictures. She showed me video, and over and over and over again, she said, he's perfect. He is the most perfect person ever. I've been demoted, folks. I've been demoted. <laughs> For those of you that are grandparents, you know what it's like to look at your grandchild. And you probably would agree, oh, he's wonderful, but as soon as she says, oh, he's the most perfect, you're ready to pull out your photos, aren't you? You're ready to argue with her because you look at your child and say, the most perfect grandchild ever. Have you ever stopped to think that God himself looks at you and he says, perfect, oh, listen, when she showed me the video, we both recognized Knox is starting to be selfish. We're watching as he is struggling with a few toys and sharing with cousins. But grandparents see their child through hearts of love, and God himself sees you through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. He looks at you, he calls you his Beloved, you are loved by God himself. And if he so loves you, can you not pour out your worship for him? We're going to give you that opportunity in a moment, but I encourage you, bask in the love of God for you and recognize it is not because you are wonderful. It is because he is and he sees you through the eyes of of seeing his son, Jesus Christ. Now, we're ready for worship, so let's stand together and invite each other this morning. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Thank you, Father, for your amazing love. If you would, take your hymn books. You want to turn to hymn number 348. We'll sing My Savior's Love.
Thank you. Please be seated. If you would, you want to take your Bibles and turn to John chapter 3. John chapter 3, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 8. As you are turning there, Nicodemus, a teacher of the Jews, shows up to Jesus at night. I can't help but think of two professors getting together. Nicodemus wouldn't have wanted to show up during the day. It would be like going to undergraduate classes. Instead, he wants to have a one-on-one -on -one with Jesus to talk of deep theology. And Jesus accommodates him and speaks to him, and yet speaks at a level at which Nicodemus is struggling to keep up. So John chapter 3, I'm going to be reading out of the New International Version. Now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you were doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly, I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, very truly, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases, you hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. If you would, please join me for prayer. Father, this morning we come to the feet of our Savior Jesus, we too need to be taught. Teach us, Father, of the Spirit and the importance of doing life in the Spirit. Father, let our weapons not be human weapons. Let it be prayer. Let it be being filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking words that the Spirit prompts us. In this place, Father, fill us with the Holy Spirit, Teach us your word. Let us see Jesus again on the throne. Father, there is a world around us that is lost. And as Jesus said, it is impossible to see the kingdom unless born of the Spirit. Father, let us go. Let us be lights in a dark world. Shining for Jesus, yes, but wanting to share the light with others. Father, this week will be difficult for the Shearer family. We want to thank you that Jeff was a follower of Jesus. At his services, let the gospel be presented. And then, Father, for each of us, sprinkle us as your missionaries in the community. Let us shine, whether it is at home, with our family and friends, at work, in clubs and organizations we belong to, whether it's in the checkout line or behind the wheel of our car, let us shine brightly for Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen.
Well, it was battered and scarred, and the auctioneer felt it was hardly worth his while to waste much time on the old violin. But he held it up with a smile. He said, "It sure ain't much, but it's all we got left. I guess we ought to sell it too." Now who's got a bid on this old violin? Just one more and we'll be through. And he cried out, "One, give me one dollar. Who'll make it two? Only two dollars. Who'll make it three? Three dollars twice. Now that's a good price. Who's got a bid for me? Raise up your hand and don't wait any longer. The auction's about to end." Who'll make it for just one dollar more to bid on this old violin? Well, the air was hot and the people stood around as the sun was setting low. From the back of the crowd, a gray-haired man came forward and picked up the bow, wiped the dust from the old violin. Then he tightened up the strings, then played out a melody pure and sweet, soft as the angels sing. Stopped, and the auction here, with the voice that was quiet and low, said, "What is my bid on this old violin?" Then he held it up with the bow. And he cried out, "One, give me one thousand. Who'll make it two? Only two thousand. Who'll make it three?" Three thousand twice. Now that's a good price. Who's got a bid for me? The people called out. What made the change? We don't understand. Then the auctioneer stopped and he said with a smile, "It was the touch of the master's hand." Now you know many a man whose life's out of tune. He's battered and scarred with sin, and he's auctioned cheap to a thankless world, much like the old violin. Then the master comes, and the foolish crowd will never understand. The worth of the soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. And he cried out, "One, give me one thousand. Who'll make it two? Only two thousand. Who'll make it three? Three thousand twice. Now that's a good price. Who's got a bid for me?" The people called out, "What made the change? We don't understand." Then the auctioneer stopped, and he said with a smile, "It was the touch of the master's hand. It was the touch of the master's hand." It was the touch of the master's hand. If you've been touched by the master's hand, I would invite you turn to number three hundred and forty-seven in your hymn book. We'll sing, and can it be? Let's stand together as we sing. Thank、you 
I want to invite uh, Sandili to come and share the word with us. Uh, as I said, he's the leader of our global partner in South Africa, uh, planting churches and uh, developing ministries that help people's lives in uh, amazing ways. And so, Sandili, come and join us. Good morning, church. Good morning. Good morning, church. Good morning. I am so, so excited to be here. And I am aware that I have an accent. And I do promise you, if you come to my country, you'll also have an accent. <laughs> so we are starting from a very same ground here. We, ho- we all have an accent, depending where you're at. Amen. Amen. And thanks to Pastor Art and uh, Pastor Scott uh, for inviting me and trusting me to come here. And I can say that I have felt the love of this community through the family that I'm staying with. Uh, I've been loved, I've been cared for, and thank you so much. Um, Yes, I am Sandile, born again, and Jesus found me. I don't come from a Christian family. I come from uh, Amzulu, uh, from South Africa, and we have our own beliefs. And Jesus, in his goodness, thought it was good for me too to be saved. Amen. Amen. And he rescued me from a lot of spiritual warfare. So my ministry has been very much about the Holy Spirit and the goodness of God. And Jesus is good. Amen. Amen. Uh, This morning, I want to speak about uh, the beautiful story of our brother Nicodemus uh, meeting Jesus Christ. And I think it's such a very profound story. Uh, when you listen and you read and you start to follow what was happening. And I think it's very easy to judge Nicodemus for his behavior. And it's very easy for us to sit on the hand side and say, but Nicodemus, why could you not recognize the Lord? But it's such a difficult thing when you are surrounded and everything around you works and everything for you is provided. And we can all look into the life of Nicodemus and understand that he was a very respected man. And he was a very well-known man. And Nicodemus had a good life. Amen. Amen. Uh, He was the lead priest. And people came to listen to him. He gave instructions. And he walked about in the market with such respect. And people knew, here comes the high priest. And now Jesus comes. And he speaks a completely different language. And he's completely turned things upside down from what they know to what the Lord is bringing. And I want to just go to, there's, a, there's a, a gentleman in the olden days when the Catholic church was the church that you had to submit to. And the only church that was working with, with, with like leadership of the, those days. And there's a gentleman called John Calvin. And he says there was something, he came up with something called Nicodemite spirit. So what he meant by that, he spoke of people that in those days, it says in the 16th century, uh, this French former uh, uh, John Calvin gave the uh, the Protestant uh, living in the Catholic countries who chose to conceal their faith out of concern for their personal safety. And he gave these guys this name because these people would be living in towns and in areas where it wasn't good to stand against the Catholic beliefs. So you had to submit and subscribe to it. But there were people that were aware of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They were aware of Jesus Christ, but they had to submit to the system. Because if you do not do that, you will die. If you do not do that, you will be ostracized. Who wants to be ostracized here? No one. We all want to be accepted. We want to be loved. We want to be noticed. We want to walk in the market and people say, here's this good man. Here's this good lady. We want people to welcome us. We want people to love us. But the question is, to what extent? Do we want to be loved, appreciated to the point of compromising the truth? So this is what I want to talk about today. And the scripture that uh, my brother Scott has read so beautifully, and I'm glad I wasn't asked to read, uh, and and, and I'm just going to ride on your great way to, to read, my brother. And Nicodemus goes, he recognizes something in Jesus that there's something about this man. There is no way he can do what he does if it wasn't for someone above. Because we know who he is, we know where he comes from. So they've got family tree, they have an understanding of how he's born and who he is. But there must be something more about him. 
This is the high priest who's got all the understanding of the Jewish beliefs within the Mosaic followers that this is how we should believe and the Messiah will come one day, but they're expecting him to come in a certain way because of the lifestyle they've created and all the hierarchy that they have built for themselves to live within the comfort. And this hierarchy allows them to do life in a way that is so great for them. But yet there are layers and layers and those who are in sin, they just have no place to enter this place of being healed and, and also being holy. So, in his wisdom, he decides that it is better for me to meet this man at night so I'm not seen to be going to hear from this new teacher in town because I am the teacher. I am the man who holds the authority and the understanding of this news of the, our king. And then when he goes to Jesus and Jesus speaks to him and he says, Very true, I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and spirit. Because flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to the spirit. This is the most confusing talk. They have went through their um, teachings, their theological understanding. This is a new talk. And they are aware of the baptism of, of water. They are aware of all things. But now he's saying, yes, you are born of a woman. You are born of, of, of the flesh. But now also you have to be born of the spirit. And Nicodemus gets stuck on the path and he says, but how can it be? How can, as an old man that I am, go back into my mother's womb and be born again? Isn't it confusing? Let's give it to Nicodemus. It is confusing. I, 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 now we're sitting on the other hand and we're looking at it. Now we understand it. It's very easy to judge this man. I do not judge this man. I feel for this man. I think I would have been in the same position. Because Nicodemus, they walk about and they're being celebrated and life is good. All of a sudden, he's been told to go and start afresh. And because if he does not, he will not enter the kingdom of God. So we, we, we see in, this, in, in, in Psalm 21, so, so in our lives that we live in, we're living, we're living amongst the most unjust community. Our world has become so difficult to live in. There's poverty, at least where I come from. There's poverty, there's injustice, there's abuse, there's brokenness. But God has called us his sons and daughters. So he's calling us to walk but not by flesh, but by the spirit. To walk not by what we understand and know, but by what the spirit of God is giving to us as life. Because each day is different. As we wake up every morning, we say, Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me, God, to walk in the way that you want me to walk. So in Psalm 21, it says, verse 11, Though they plot evil against you and devise wicked schemes, they cannot succeed. So, like, though there are evils around you, though there are people that speak a different language, but they will not succeed because your God is with you. So, the life of Nicodemus in the transformation they understand, it's all carnal, it's all in his head, it's all the understanding and the, the religious beliefs, but now it's been asked that unless you are born of the spirit, it is difficult for you to enter this place. So we are aware, if we read the scripture, Jesus was not fond of the religious leader's lifestyle. He was not fond of their beliefs and behavior amongst the people. And we see him, when he comes across the sinners, he uplifts them and he underpins them. And he, 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 he speaks life into them because his aim and heart is for them to, to shine the light into their lives so that they can receive. But he, when he goes to the religious folks, he becomes very harsh and very hard. And he says very tough things to them because he's saying, you guys have to really wake up from what you're doing because you are even making it difficult for those guys to enter the kingdom of God. So one of the things that Jesus did not appreciate is that they overburden people. So like in, in, verse, in Matthew 23, 4, it says, they tie up heavy uh, composum loads upon them on, on, on the other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. So there's a lot of rules and regulations and things that you shall do this and that and that, but there's absolutely no solution of how. If someone says, stay out of drugs, don't do this, don't do that, but they are not coming there to assist you. 
how that is good for you to know the truth, but there's no hope. And then he says they are motivated by attention. You see in Matthew 23, verse 5 to 7, he says everything they do is done for the people to see. So it's a show. They are showmen. They are showing off. They make their phylacteries wide and their tassels on their garments long. They, they love the place of honor at the banquet and the most important seats in the synagogue. They love to be greeted with respect and at the marketplace, at the marketplace and they are called rabbi by others. So you can see these are people that when they walk, people are surrounding them, people are, are, are humiliating, and people are, are respectful of them. They, they, they are people of stature. So Nicodemus has so much to give out, has so much to sacrifice in his flesh in order to follow Jesus. See, look at his life. He's like, I'm living a very good life. If I follow this man, I'm following a, a, a fugitive, a man that is wanted to be killed, a man that we discuss about how to stop him. So this is like a, a career suicide. How can I join this man? How can the, I can see there's something in him, but how can, how can it be that I now I must sacrifice all this for that? And number three says, they made it hard for others to enter the kingdom of God. And in, in Matthew 23, again, verse 13, it says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. That's a very strong word. If someone called me a hypocrite, I'll be like, Ooh, whew, wow, that wasn't loving. He speaks to them with such strong words. You hypocrites, you, you, you shut the door of the kingdom on, uh, uh, of heaven in people's faces. You yourself do not ent- you, you will not enter. Now will you let those enter? who are trying to. So their level of judgment and the things they've put before people just make it so difficult for people to receive God and to be able to enter. So their ministry was not helping to underpin and to build up people, to help people to see the Lord. But it was making it difficult for them to see how useless they are and how much they have sinned. But now, this birth of the Spirit is not the birth that is, it's still everything that the Pharisees were working towards. It was all based on law and legalities, the do's do's and don'ts. But now the spiritual side is not relying on man, but it's relying on Jesus Christ our Lord. So now, this is the grace of God that has come, unmerited favor that comes to all of us who were once sinners, but now we've been set free by his grace. And this grace is what gives us life. And that's what Jesus is talking about to Nicodemus, that it, is, it has to happen through the power of the Spirit. So by his corner, by his understanding, and by what they know as Jews, they are struggling to reconcile this new Lord who's coming. And he, there's no way it can be him. But there's something lacking. All they see is in the flesh. All they see is a written code that does not give life. Because the written code will only give life when it's been influenced by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. So, so being born of the Spirit helps you to recognize spiritual warfare. So when I engage in engagements or wherever I am, I'm always now saying, Lord, please show me what I do not see. Because there are always more layers in life than just what we see with our eyes. So in my engagement, I'm always asking Jesus, here I am, doesn't matter where I am. I'm in different meetings. I could be in, in, in offices with government. I could be in hospital. I could be anywhere. I'll say, Lord, help me to see what I do not see. Then I'll start speaking of things that might seem like they don't matter, but they do matter because it's what the Spirit is revealing to me. So I don't go by what I have and by what I understand, but I always have to rely on the Holy Spirit. So I'm always relying on the Holy Spirit. I'm never standing, I'm not standing here in the comfort of who I am and what I know. If the Holy Spirit will stop talking, I'll have to stop talking. And yes, it's awkward, but I have to stop talking. Because what else can I say to you guys? How do I know you? But only he knows what you're going through. And only he knows what you need. Only he knows where you're stuck. And only he knows what hurt you've endured. And only he can go into a space of lament with you and bring healing. None of us can do that. 
So when we engage with others, we're trusting on the Holy Spirit and we're relying on him. So Satan seeks to destroy and isolate. And with, uh, we sit in, in the Garden of, 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 of Eden with, between um, uh, Adam and Eve and how he, he, he gets to, to, to Eve and then, then, then the way he's able to win both of them when Adam also comes, he also fall into sin. So in most cases, when the enemy is going to win and when the enemy is working, he always wedge some form of division between people. It starts just by something that's been said by someone. All of a sudden, I'm so angry with art. How can he say that? How can he speak like that about me? Then there's a distance between us. And that distance starts to breathe life of death. It starts to breathe, breathe darkness into the space. And then the division starts to continue. So Satan seeks to destroy and isolate where, where we fail to see the image of God in others. So, so, so our duty is that whomever we meet, so when Jesus goes around with sinners, they do not understand who they are. They have been living the life in darkness and they living the life is either they are tax collectors or whatever they're doing, but he goes and spends time with them. And when he feasts with them as they're eating, one of them says, Lord, I have taken so much money from people. You know what? I'm going to go and pay them back. I'm going to go even give extra. Jesus has said nothing to him about his behavior. He has not looked into correcting how he behaves. He has just come to have fellowship with him. He just sees him. He sees the image of God in him. He says, my father made you. My father breathed life into you. So the breath of life resides within you. So just imagine the world we live in if people saw people that way. If you saw me as someone who, who, who is an image bearer of God, don't you think we'll have a different way to treat each other? Don't you think the wars we fight will not be fought? <laughs> because how can we go and destroy what God has created? How dare I go and go against what God has done? I cannot do so. But we do so because we fail to see God in others. So God is a, is a source of all good and Satan is an author of evil. So the goodness comes from God. The life comes from God and death through Satan and evil. So he will attempt to take us down who will always be working on making sure that we are losing that understanding of our image of who we are in God. So I live in a community where there's so much struggles. There's so much issues in our communities. There's violence there's drunkenness, there's thievery. It is so easy for me to judge and say, so and so the thief. So we're helping this one young man and we're trying to restore him. He doesn't have much. And he comes home, he plays with my kids, he does everything. Then the next thing, my bicycle is gone. It's been stolen at the garage. And my son's bicycle is stolen. And now I'm always obviously nervous now. Who has come into my property? I'm looking through the cameras I can't see. So definitely must be someone who's been in my house who knows where my cameras are facing because I can't see who took my bikes. But as we continue to pray and discern, then we realize that no, it is this boy. He did not tell us. We just knew from the spirit that it's him. So I take him on the right. Firstly, one of the pastors says, tell me what you've done. He's like, huh? He did it in the middle of the night. No one should have known. Then he tries to hide. Then I come to him as well. I say, you have done something at my house. And if you don't repent, this is going to kill you at the end. You do have to repent because someone will hurt you in, in their house at night. And he cries. He says, I'm sorry. I took your bicycle. This is the boy we're inviting and helping. Let me tell you what happens. Everything in you wants to protect your kids, want to protect your property, you want to close doors to him. But the Spirit of God, God says no. <laughs> you cannot close the door on him. That's not who he is. He is my son. I love him. I want to restore him. So we meet with him again. We say, but I can't have you in my house and you take him from me. If you want a bicycle, tell me we can make a plan. But the first thing that came into mind was, I need to shut my door and make sure I've got girls here. Now all my protective instinct kicks in. I need to make sure my family is safe. And now I go to my son, I go to my kids, I say, kids, 
I want you to know that you're they actually have bought him Christmas presents. They sacrificed their money for Christmas. They say we're going to buy him Christmas presents. And they've got gifts here for him. And then now we discover that he's stolen. So we, now we say, well, this is ministry. We need to take our kids into this journey with us. We can't hide it from them. We say, well, you know that uh, our bikes went missing. Uh, we know now who took it. Oh, who? It's in Fundo. Oh, okay. But we just need to know that what you guys think. Because we got him presents we want to bless him. And the youngest says, oh yeah, we give him his presents. <laughs> and I look to my wife, I'm like, Jeez, what's happening here? These kids, come on, be frustrated with us. And then the other, the, other, the, other, the other kid says, well, we need to give him a chance. I think we should, yeah, they all agree, we should give him a chance. And my wife and I realize, we're the only ones with issues. <laughs> These kids are fine. They're like, he's told, why did he do that? Oh, I guess he was hungry. What, well, Dad, let's give him his presents. Tell him to come so he can get his presents. Folks, unless we believe like the kids believe, we will struggle. We start to formulate and build barriers thinking we're protecting ourselves, but we're only creating a distance from us and others, and we're creating a distance from us and the creation of God. Amen. So in, 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 in James 1, James 13, it says, When tempted, no one should say, God uh, is tempting me. God cannot be tempt, uh, tempted by the evil. Nor does he tempt anyone. That's, that's from James. So if you are being tempted, the enemy is working on Don't say, God is testing me. It's in no interest of trying to break you. It's got all interest to love you and build you up. We will get into challenges and we'll overcome and we can learn from that. But that's not that God is coming here to hurt us. And then the battle we have is not against flesh and blood. So for the flesh sets its desires against the spirit. Sorry, yes. For the flesh sets its desires against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to, uh, to one another. So you, you may not do things that you please. So what I would have wanted to do is to say to this boy, don't come to my house again, boy, I'm sorry. I already had a police case, but I had to close it. As soon as I knew it was him. Close, close the case, I'm dealing with it differently now. But everything in me and my flesh wanted to deal with the boy. So we all shall be led by the Spirit. So there's this life of the Apostle Paul. Uh, and Paul was one of the people that believed in the ways that uh, Nicodemus believed in. And, but he also went out to make sure that he's fulfilling the goal for his community. He has to make sure that the Christians were feeling the pain of choosing Christ. And we see a man who's now being touched by the Spirit, which is a complete opposite of, the, of Nicodemus. Nicodemus is not touched by the Spirit. He hears these words. He struggles with it. Yes, towards the end, we hear Nicodemus advocating for Jesus, but he is still standing with his brothers. He has not come out of that place. He is still with the Pharisees. So, in, like it says, the most of the time, the Pharisees were, not, were, were at odds with the Sadducees and another Jews said sector, which is the, a group of, of Jews. But the, the two parties joined forces to conspire against Jesus. They voted together in, in, in the Sanhedrin to uh, demand his, his death so that the, the Romans uh, carried it out. So, this is a group of other Jews and other Jews they were always in disagreement. But about Jesus, they were like, this is absolutely, we should get this man. And Nicodemus was part of that. So we, we move into the story of, of the Apostle Paul. Paul is on his way to persecute the Christians, to carry out what all this group wants. But then there, he get touched by the Spirit. He gets a new birth. He gets a new life. And that life is what changed Apostle Paul. What he really wants to do in his heart is being transformed. What he really believes is being transformed. And his eyes are closed. And he's like basically sitting on his, knee, is on his knees saying, what is this? Who are you, Lord? He says, why have you persecuted me? He said, but I've never, I've never done that to you. He said, when you touch those people, you're touching me. So there is a, a huge difference between the two where one is moving by the laws and the rules and the other has been moving by the laws and the rules and that is giving death and is hurting people. But now the Apostle Paul has been touched 
by the Spirit, and the next thing he's baptized, and the next thing he's now going out to preach about Jesus Christ. So in verse 17 it says, Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, as we were coming here to kill us, <laughs> the Lord had appeared to you. He sent me so that you may see again and filled with the Holy Spirit and, and be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the most crucial thing. All of us, we should be hungry to be filled by the Holy Spirit because that is what will transform and that's what will help us as we walk to really be understanding what God is calling and what God is requiring of us. And brothers and sisters, is the life we live in Africa forces us every day to be discerning and hearing. I cannot afford a minute or a second to be just walking on my own feelings and the way I think. I need to always be trusting God because we are always faced with challenges. And every second you turn, the enemy is watching. But the good news is Jesus Christ, our Lord, has went before us and died so that we may have life. Now we live in that hope and the trust of the, of the goodness of God. I want to close. Thank you so much for listening. And I pray that the Spirit of God may guide you and lead you as you continue to do life. And this is a good place of really not relying on our strength, but relying on him who died for us. Amen. I don't think our closing hymn needs any more introduction. The victory is in Jesus. The hymn is number 353. We'll sing together. Let's stand as we do so. Red.
Father, on this day, help us to follow your spirit, to be open to your leadings, your guidings, your nudgings, your wisdom, that we might love you and serve you and serve those around us as you would have us. In Jesus' name, amen.